what are the heart sounds that you hear during this time frame? And what are the, what are the pressure changes that, that you see? The point of the slide, though, is to show that the filling of the heart occurs during that aspect. So it basically starts here, where the mitral valve, you know, all of a sudden swings open and all this blood that was waiting up in the atrium dumps into the ventricle. And then it kind of slows down a little bit, you get to this point, and you come around to here, and all of a sudden you get this, this little bit of atrial kick that pushes the last little volume, little volume into, the, into the ventricles. Okay? So it's, most of it is purely passive. Okay? It's just a, you know, you have a pressure gradient, <coughs> and the blood's going to flow according to that pressure gradient. Okay? So a large portion of the, of the, of the, of the majority, all of drilling, occurs during, uh, during diastole. And that will be important when we talk about uh, resuscitation. Okay. Go to the next. All right, so here's a uh, diagram of the heart. And you can see the hearts today. They're really they're, they're pretty good sized hearts. Uh, <laughs> it's one big, uh, he ate like a pig. Uh, it's huge. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's about this big, so whoever gets that, you know, whatever group gets that, you, you, you're in luck. He, he must have had a, a dilated cardiomyopathy or something. <laughs> so uh, just looking at the heart, so the major vessels, so coming off the aorta, the first vessels off the aorta are the coronary vessels. And so we have the left main that then branches very quickly to the circumflex and the LAD that's coming down, coming down here. Okay. And then the right coronary comes off this way. So we have the aorta coming off here, pulmonary veins uh, uh, coming in, uh, uh, I'm sorry, pulmonary artery coming out of the right ventricle, and then branches off uh, upwards. Now this vessel is also called, there's another name for the LED. Does anybody know what that? Well, it is, it is the Widowmaker. <laughs> there's, there's, uh, why is that? Why is it called the Widowmaker? Because it because it supplies so much tissue that if you you know knock that out you know that you're you're in trouble. There's actually there's a number of uh, rowing teams visiting here right now out at the rowing center. I noticed one of the University of Michigan boats is called the Widowmaker. <laughs> so, I'm not sure I want to row that one. So anyway, there's another name for this vessel uh, though. It's called the interventricular artery. Interventricular. So when you're doing a dissection, you can actually use that as kind of a landmark to separate the left and the right, the left and the right ventricles. You can also figure, and I noticed on the hearts that they're, they're pretty nice because you can easily pick out like the pulmonary artery and the aorta. You just stick your finger down in with a glove, stick your finger down in <laughs> either the aorta or the pulmonary artery. You can see exactly that it's going into the in either the right or the left ventricle. And then if you flip it over, you can see where the, where the pulmonary veins are, are, are coming in as well. So, um, so, one of the things that's unique about the coronary circulation, just as the heart fills during diastole, the coronary arteries get their flow during diastole. Right? So, in, in that, on the next slide, it shows that if we look at left coronary blood flow, and it's during systole, because the heart is squeezing down, is compressing those vessels, the blood flow goes down. When it relaxes, the flow goes up. And so coronary blood flow is a diastolic phenomenon. And so that becomes important when we talk about chest compressions and, res and resuscitation. Okay? I was telling Brandon, we, I saw an interesting patient <clears throat> at Good News uh, last week, a uh, young man from Mexico, well he wasn't young, he's 54, um, well it is young, <laughs> from my perspective that's the case, uh, from Mexico, uh, and he had a congenital heart problem. He was able to describe it pretty well. And basically what he had was, or has, is what's called a myocardial bridge. Anybody heard of, heard of that? 
Maybe I give a rat's ass what it is. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can actually dive into this. Um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it doesn't show up well if you write with the projector. Oh, oh, I see. So, um, so let's just say here, here's a, Can you see this? Okay. So here's a carnary. Let's say. Let's just say. Uh, can you go back? Yes. So let's just say it's the LED. Okay. So the LED is coming down, and all of a sudden, it dives into the myocardium, or there's a myocardial bridge that forms over it. And then you come down a little bit further, and it comes back out again. So if you look at this, every time his heart contracts, you can just see, because the Jason showed me a film of a guy who had this yesterday, the blood flow just goes away when the heart contracts. And then relax, contract, and relax. So he has this bridge over this, and I'm not sure which vessel he had. But he, fortunately, he's, he's asymptomatic. Um, he said that when he when they first diagnosed it, he would get short of breath and get chest pain. But now he now he's okay. Any idea why he's okay now? Collaterals. Collateral vessels. Yeah, he's probably developed collateral vessels around that to, to, to take care of that. Uh, so the key point is on this on the, on the next slide is that blood flow is a diastolic is a diastolic phenomenon. Okay, all right. So we have five minutes. So we'll pick up the pace. All right. So here's what happens with a cardiac arrest. So we're looking at mean arterial pressure, coronary perfusion pressure, and mean venous pressure. So this is blood coming back to coming back to the heart. So normal contraction, sinus rhythm. V-fib, those pressures just drop like a rock. The venous pressure is actually increasing into the heart because you still have blood coming back. Okay? Blood is still returning, it's just that the pump's not working. So anytime a pump starts to fail, what happens is downstream, you don't get anything, but you know up here, you're getting backup of, of fluid, fluid coming in. And so that pressure is increasing. Okay, so we'll go to the... So when somebody has an arrest, there's, you can think of these three phases. This is the big, this is, uh, material. This is <coughs> big testing material. Okay, all right. So uh, this is uh, some work that Mike Weisfeld did uh, quite a while back. So if you just look at the time you know, following an arrest, they divide it into three phases. There's an electrical phase, circulatory phase, and then metabolic. And you know that if you get out here, you know, and you haven't done anything, you know, mm -hmm. chances of surviving are pretty, uh, are, are slim to none. If you can, if you can shock them in here, that's really, really good. What do you think of the chances of actually getting something by this point? Pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Maybe it depends if you're in the hospital or if you happen to have one nearby, but uh, usually not. This is a critical phase here, the circulatory phase. This is when chest compressions and resuscitation are critically important. And that is because the blood still has plenty of oxygen in it. The oxygen doesn't, doesn't disappear when they've had an arrest. It's still there. So you just got to get the blood, you just have to get that circulating so it can get to the, get to the, uh, uh, the brain and the coronary, uh, uh, coronary vessels uh, as well. Uh, okay, next, then we'll go to the next one. So what happens <coughs> is, you know, ventilation here, but what, what you see is during, during compression, that's systole. When you let up, that's diastole. So what are the two things happening in diastole? The, the heart's filling and the coronary vessels are getting their, are getting their, uh, their blood flow. So the chest weak recoil refills the heart. That increases the preload, filling of the heart. Preload is the load the heart sees before contraction. And this is compression is providing systole. So systole and diastole. And you're being the systole and di <coughs> diastole for that, uh, for that uh, victim. Okay. So here's why we now emphasize compressions only. 
If you look at coronary perfusion pressure, and we'll just focus here on this white portion here. So we're doing compressions, we're patting the rest, pressure is down here, compression, compression, compression. You get the coronary perfusion pressure up, you stop to give a breath. Be right back down. Now you gotta come all the way back up again. Down, you give a breath. So, so the whole idea of just continuous compressions is such that once you get the coronary perfusion pressure up there, it'll stay up there. And if you can keep that coronary perfusion pressure up there, you're gonna improve the viability of the heart and you'll improve or decrease the likelihood that that heart's gonna have a go into cardiogenic shock. So very, uh, uh, very critical uh, to, to, to minimize this if, if you provide it at, at all. So, <clears throat> so we're back to the guy with the condom. So just remember the, the, the notion about wall tension to develop a pressure in the size of the heart. Okay? So we're, we're flipping this so it's now active instead of passive. It's a certain amount of wall tension, develop a certain pressure, and that's going to be a function of how big the heart is. Okay, so on the next slide, have you ever seen a heart fibrillate? I mean, a real heart fibrillate? You have? No. Somebody was nine, and he said, In a video. In a video. Oh, I mean, I mean, oh, right no. there. <laughs> no, but well, the video is good enough. What happens to it when it, when it fibrillates? Well, it quivers, yeah, it's just doing this, but what else does it do? Blows up like a toad, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's quivering, and remember we have all that venous blood coming back? It blows up like this. So if the heart is like this, and it's not getting really good coronary blood flow, and you try to shock it, what do you think it'll do? It may respond, but it's having to overcome a lot of work in order to, to, try to, to try to contract anymore. So what's helpful is if you can do chest compressions to reduce the size of the heart, to get it down to a normal size, you've also increased the coronary perfusion, you've increased the filling, so now when you shock it, it's in much better shape in order to take over and pick up the more normal rhythm and, and function. Okay? I'm not sure what the next. Yes? So, how long would be decompression for a shock? <clears throat> That's a great question. Um, some can, I've heard the, 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 the rule of thumb is somewhere between 100 and 200 compressions before shocking. Yeah. Now, under most circumstances, it's probably going to be that many uh, anyway. By the time someone starts compressions, someone runs and gets the AED and they come back, they'll probably have been doing some compressions. But it is helpful to do that just because you've got this, you want to take this part and bring it down to this size a little bit, plus having given it some increased coronary flow and increased increased flow. Okay? So that's a, that's a very good question. So chest compressions are important. This is Jason, one of Jason's uh, daughters. This was actually out at the Starlight Fireworks. Uh, I can't remember if it was this year. How many have been out there? 15, 18, 16. Starlight Fireworks, yeah. It's a big you, you, you guys did a great job with that. Okay, so uh, last slide. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Sam has put up here all of the different things to kind of think about when we're going through the dissection, the different layers, epicardial layers, myocardial, endocardial, the uh, anterior, inferior, lateral, and posterior walls, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, aorta, inferior, superior, pulmonary, right left atrium, right left ventricle, and the, and the different, uh, the different vessels. The hearts are good size, and you, you should be able to you know, see all of these, and we'll, we'll, all, we'll be walking around any questions?